Before I start, I would like to formally acknowledge that this event is being held on the traditional land of the Nyongor people. So welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. This is our 12th ECU business flashlight. So we started this event in 2016. The ideas of the event, behind the event is to allow us to communicate, have dialogues with the industry and the government. Right? So we actually contribute to the communication dissemination of our research and we also get input from the industry and the government in terms of the topic that are interested to both our parties, right? to, both, uh, to all of us as well. So uh, today we, we have an interesting topic to discuss, right? short shortage short accommodations and I'm pleased to have three speakers with us. Right? The first one that I would like to thank is the keynote speaker. Jessica Shaw, MLA, the member of Swan Hill in the WL Legislative Assembly and Chair of the Parliamentary Economics and Industry Standing Committee. Welcome, Jess, and thank you. The second speaker is Dr. Dale Putland, Director of Sustainable Development, Sire of Augusta and Margaret River. Welcome, Dale, thank you very much. And our own Professor Kerry Brown as our inside speaker, Professor of Employment and Industry and Director of the Center for Innovative Practice at the School of Business and Law. In, in, at Edith Cohen University. So it's a pleasure as well to have our senior deputy vice chancellor, Professor Ashad Omari, with us today. Uh, this uh, event uh, is a, a continuous event that we actually held to, uh, to actually allow us to also not only discuss the issue of business, but we also got an assisted event, which is called SEO Law Assembly. Right. So for those who actually probably who came in the previous our inaugural issue law assembly held in this hotel as well. So please join us as well in the future. So in the both issue business life part and issue law assembly. So welcome again once more. Uh, without further ado as well, I would like to invite our lovely executive dean, Professor Mariam Omari, to formally open <laughs> the event. Please, Mariam. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome. It's a delight to have so many people in the room. I think we've only got a couple of um, empty chairs, so you guys pull a crowd. <laughs> um, I just want to thank all of our speakers for giving so generously of their time and expertise. Um, I also want to thank uh, Hadrian. Uh, this event is uh, his brainchild, and um, as he said, I didn't realize we're on the 12th iteration. Um, that's quite a significant achievement. It really is about us bringing together our expertise and the research that we do. Um, and in this case, we're represented um, very aptly by Professor Kerry Brown. Um, our research has got applications in the real work environment. We don't really just do research for research's sake. It's about giving back something to the community. So this, these sort of events are organized regularly and it's about bringing together industry, our expertise from the university and really starting some discussions um, and, and seeing where they take us in a way. I see students in the room, I see alumni in the room, I see industry partners in the room and it's a delight to have all of you here. And colleagues. colleagues. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jessica. I'm not checking my mail. <laughs> I just want to read Jessica's background. Um, so Jessica Shaw, MLA is a member for Swan Hills in the WA Legislative Assembly and Chair of the Parliament's Economics and Industry Standing Committee. The committee is currently undertaking inquiries into short stay accommodation on microgrids and associated technologies. Prior to entering Parliament, Jessica was a senior commercial executive in the energy sector responsible for developing and managing a wide range of regulated and unregulated assets. She has extensive experience in the business development, commercial management, and economic regulation in both electricity and gas. Jessica's early career was in foreign affairs. She was political and economic att attaché to the British High Commission and also worked for the Australian Senate's Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. Jessica has three undergraduate degrees in law. Wow, three? Um, politics and International Relations and a Master's in Law from the University of Cambridge. Please welcome Jessica to the stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for the, uh, for the invitation and, and for your very kind introduction. Um, can I begin this evening just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. 
Can I also thank Edith Cowan University for the invitation to speak with you tonight. Um, I thought it was very interesting to hear you say how one of the core purposes for your organisation is to continue to contribute to public policy debate. And most certainly my committee appreciated ECU's submission into our, um, our parliamentary process. The information that you provided us in your submission certainly was very useful for the committee and I really enjoyed um, the hearing that we held where, where both Kerry and Hadrian appeared and we, we had a fascinating discussion. So I really do um, admire and support ECU's work and, and so thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to be with you this evening to discuss a topic that's been front of my mind for the last 12 months, um, the changes underway in the short stay accommodation industry. Um, we've obviously been conducting uh, this very extensive inquiry. Um, you find me, however, in a very tricky position um, this evening. When I accepted Hadrian's invitation to speak, I was brimming with confidence that, uh, that we, will have, uh, we would have completed our inquiry and I'd be at full liberty to share with you what our findings and recommendations are. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I am this evening, um, actually this morning, after a very long sitting week, we sat till midnight, or one o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, we sat till 11, 11.30 on Wednesday and had another late night yesterday and this morning back for another four hours working with my committee finalising the report for this inquiry. We are quite literally in real time at the moment workshopping our findings and recommendations and assessing all of the evidence. And the really interesting thing for me tonight will be not just, I guess I'll tell you what we've heard, but um, the way that we have run this inquiry, it's quite formal. It's quite a Q&A style, you know, as a committee, we ask witnesses questions. I'm going to be really interested to hear the discussion in the room amongst the audience and my colleagues on the panel um, to, for a very different way of, of hearing about this incredibly complex topic. But I can't tell you what's in my report and uh, you know we are, we're so close but um, uh, I can't do that. Um, I do have some scope though to share some thoughts and, and I'm very happy to do that um, to discuss the major themes that have emerged from the public evidence but obviously parliamentary privilege and what committees can and can't do is a very topical issue in the news today and I don't want to end up in jail. So, <laughs> and I certainly don't want to end up on the wrong side of my boss. So, um, so I will uh, respect parliamentary privilege. So any thoughts that I do share tonight are my own. My own thoughts, my own observations and are certainly not a reflection of any internal deliberation of the committee. So having dispensed with the uh, disclaimers, <laughs> Um, let me talk about the inquiry. The lengthy time that this inquiry has taken um, and the difficulty that as a committee we've experienced in uh, developing a, a set of sensible, measured and practical recommendations perhaps reflects the, the sheer complexity of this topic. More than any other that we have yet tackled as a committee, this one has proven remarkably complex and very polarising. It's drawn a record number of submissions ever for a Western Australian Legislative Assembly's parliamentary inquiry. We've never had more submissions than on this single topic and from right across Western Australia. And it's exposed an issue that is having a broad range of impacts and triggers a wide array of policy responses at different levels of government and a wide array of differing community responses as well. Previous inquiry, we, had, we set the previous record, by the way, on uh, regional airfares. Um, and uh, that, I seem to pick these topics, right, that, that end up being really complicated. We set the previous record, but that was really easy because there was clearly an issue with the airlines and then hundreds of people who were really angry with them. But this issue is incredibly complicated. A number of different stakeholders, a number of different perspectives, and so it's been quite a challenge um, for the committee to navigate their way through. And look, I. As a newly minted politician, so I've only been doing this for, for two years, um, it, it, it has given me a, a fascinating window into political processes. It's taught me a lot about our individual abilities to participate and influence those processes, not just as members of parliament, but also as individuals within our communities. 
And it's given me a sense of the, the rapidly evolving intersections between communities and polities and industries and technologies. And that's the sort of thing that I really wanted to share with you tonight. And I, I want to discuss them with you because as researchers, as industry members, as citizens, and as policy makers, I do think we need to have a broader conversation about how we listen to and learn from one another and how we work together and engage to tackle increasingly complex policy issues. So, um, and, and how we can all work together to, to, to improve the quality of A, our political, uh, our political environment. I hate the fact that politics is such a dirty word these days and everyone says, oh, it's political. Everything's political. We all have a role to play. We all have abilities to participate in the conversation and make our politics better. And this process for me has been a bit of a case study in that. And I, I just, I guess I want to touch on those issues too. And, and uh, hopefully um, you'll find it as interesting as, as I have. So probably the first most important thing I can talk to you about is the genesis of the inquiry because it, it illustrates the political complexities around an issue like this one. So in September of, of 2018, my colleague um, on the committee, um, Terry Redman, who's the member for Warren Blackwood, put a notice on the uh, Legislative Assembly's paper that he, won he was moving a motion that my, he hadn't spoken to me about it. He moved a motion in the chamber that the parliamentary, uh, the, the Economics and Industry Standing Committee um, conduct an inquiry looking at the risks to consumers and operators of non-registered and non-compliant accommodation utilising online booking platforms such as Airbnb. So Terry put what I think was quite a charged um, motion onto the notice paper. It was reflecting the sentiment that he was receiving in his electorate, the heat from his community about how bad these online platforms were. And I spoke to Minister, and, and of course, as, as that community's advocate, absolutely appropriate that he do that. I spoke to the Minister, uh, Minister Safiotti, who's the Minister for Planning. This falls within the planning portfolio and asked her what she thought. She said, look, I support the inquiry. But uh, this is a complex issue. It's not all bad. Like there, there are legitimately broad range of stakeholders here. So maybe see if you can negotiate a less pejorative terms of reference, set of terms of reference, and let's see if we can come up with a bipartisan response to this very complex issue. A lot of the time all people hear about is the punch and duty, question time, abuse that goes on, and there's no other word for it really, abuse, that goes on in the parliament. But there's an awful lot of really positive, bipartisan, multi-partisan work that goes on within the institution of parliament and the committee's process is usually where a lot of that work is done. So um, the, the minister was very interested to see if working together the Liberal, Labor and National parties could come up with some multi-partisan recommendations about a sensible, um, non-partisan, but political, because everything's political, outcome. And pol political isn't, as I say, a dirty word. So Terry and I sat down and we negotiated some terms of reference. Uh, we said that we would inquire into and report on matters relating to the regulation of short-stay accommodation. So the first subterm was the forms and regulatory status of short-stay accommodation in both regional and metropolitan WA, including the powers available to local government, the changing market and social dynamics, because there are some significant social impacts in the issue, the issues in the sector, particularly how these emerging business models are affecting traditional business models, and how different jurisdictions, both in Australia and overseas, have responded to the policy challenges. So we were off and racing. We got that uh, in quite close terms of reference through the, uh, through the um, inquiry. And I said to Terry, I reckon this is going to be a quick one. We should be able to bed this down pretty quickly. I'm sure it will just fly under the radar. We'll get it done. And uh, how wrong we were. <laughs> so um, we quickly realised um, how complex this topic was and what a plurality of views there are. There are differences between regional and metropolitan areas. There are differences between the regions themselves. There are very loud voices. There are very well-resourced multinational companies and highly organised and very professional lobbying organisations. 
And let me tell you, they're not afraid to use Twitter. I would like a, I'd like a dollar for every time over the last 12 months I've been tagged in some sort of Twitter war between usually um, uh, Airbnb and the Australian Hotels Association and any number of other different lobbying organisations. They, they are really not afraid to try and use social media to try and influence members of parliament and uh, very loud voices, like I say, organised, well resourced. But as I say, we also had a record number of submissions from the people of Western Australia. There were 278 submissions that we accepted as individual submissions. We had 307 template submissions from Airbnb's clients. So Airbnb emailed all of their people who operate short stay accommodation and said, here, send the committee uh, this template email and let them know how you feel. So we got another 307 of those. Um, only 146 of those, though, were from WA. So, so we did actually make sure that we could confirm that the people involved were indeed um, electors or citizens of, of Western Australia and the properties they were talking about were Western Australian properties. So about 50%, as it turns out, of the template Airbnbs were actually from Australia. Some were even from Hong Kong, California. It was pretty crazy. Um, the, uh, the AHA also encouraged their members to provide submissions and in fact both organisations provided training and coaching and, um, and uh, encouragement to their organisation, to their members to lobby uh, the, the, the committee and in fact after one of the hearings one of the organisation's clients had left the coaching notes sitting on one of the <laughs> one of the seats in the in the hearing room. So that was that was rather interesting. Um, we did, in addition to holding uh, collecting submissions, we held 31 hearings, eight of them in the southwest. We also skyped to Broome, Albany, and Denmark to make sure we were hearing from right across the, the state. They seemed to be the areas where there, we were receiving um, submissions to indicate there was a, a view. Uh, the rest of the hearings we held in Perth. We tried something absolutely unique in, in the history of parliamentary committees. Because we had so many submissions, we decided to trial a different way of getting feedback from the community. So with the regional airfares inquiry, we trialled both televising our hearings so that people in the regions who couldn't attend in Perth could nonetheless see what was going on. And when we did visit the regions, we held town hall meetings where the committee sat and we heard feedback from the community. For this inquiry, what we decided to do was do a depositions process. Typically what we do is we have, uh, as committees, very formal, which uh, Kerry has <laughs> sat through and Hadrian has sat through, very formal hearing processes. They go for about an hour, the committee sits there and fires questions at the witnesses. It can be quite intimidating and it certainly doesn't encourage people, normal people, to come in and participate in the processes of their parliament and make themselves heard to their representatives. And, and I certainly, as a new MP, I really want to encourage people to take more of an interest and participate more fully in the, in the processes of parliament. So we trialled a deposition um, uh, sessions. We had um, sessions down in the southwest where the overwhelming number of submissions came from. And, uh, and deposition sessions up in Perth where we invited people both for and against to provide three to five minute um, depositions and it's good to see that some people who provided depositions are, are actually in the room tonight. So um, hopefully I'm not doing you uh, a, 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 a disservice. So we really appreciated the level of engagement that we had through that process. It certainly brought home a lot of messages to both myself and I know to my colleagues and, and I think um, hopefully it represents a very very effective way where your representatives um, hear, not just from the loud, well-organised and well-resourced voices, but also hear from the people who are on the front line and living, living these public policy issues. So what did we hear? We heard that this is a rapidly changing and growing industry, but it's really difficult to quantify what the changes are and how rapidly the change is happening. There's a, a real information gap here. Um, but what we do know, the very first Airbnb listing in Western Australia was in August 2008 and it was a bed and breakfast in Como. Fast forward two years, there were 30 listings on Airbnb. There's now over 12,000 listings in Western Australia on Airbnb. On the figures that we have, letting it, again, you know, some organisations will dispute those figures, but I think it's fair to say there are around 12,000. 
there has been a 24% growth in listings in the 12 months to December 2018. So we're seeing exponential growth in the rate of listings and almost all of these new listings are unhosted. And it's an important distinguish, uh, uh, distinction to make. Hosted is a room in someone's house. Unhosted are entire properties, either homes or apartments um, that are listed as unhosted facilities. Airbnb uh, provided evidence to us that um, on average hosts receive somewhere in the order of $7,600 for listing their homes in 50 nights across a 12 month period. So quite a bit of money to, to, be, uh, to be made. I'll talk you through the, the major stakeholder groups, the major groups of perspectives and, and their general, uh, the evidence they provided to us. Firstly, there were the traditional accommodation providers and they, they fell into two broad groups. There was your small bed and breast breakfast operators, your small hoteliers, your small motels, usually in regional WA or down in Rockingham or Mandurah, small businesses. Um, then we heard from large hoteliers, predominantly from the Perth CBD. Both those groups talked about declining occupancy rates and talked about the emergence of Airbnb at the same time. And there are, but there were some real questions around cause and effect, because correlation is not necessarily causation. And the report will have more to say about that, that there's, there have been um, declining occupancy rates and, in, and at different rates across the state, um, but correlation is not necessarily causation, and, uh, and that is an interesting part of the report to, to have a read, uh, to read when, when you have the opportunity. Um, one of the things they also mentioned was that they are held to far higher standards than unhosted and hosted um, online short-term rentals. They are required to meet uh, significant um, regulatory and licensing burdens. The building codes are different. The licensing, the inspections for pools, the inspections for food preparation areas, the fees that are charged, local government fees and state government fees, all apply to the traditional accommodation sectors but don't apply to these new forms of short-term rentals there are significant regulatory burdens that the traditional sector faces that the, un, uh, the unhosted or the new forms of uh, accommodation just aren't exposed to. Um, they, they claim that these forms of accommodation have negative impacts to local economies. They say that short-stay accommodation um, providers don't spend as much, uh, short-stay accommodation customers, sorry, don't spend as much as customers that access traditional forms of accommodation when they holiday. We had some evidence presented to us that said they come down with bootloads full of food, they self-cook, they self-cater, they don't add anything to the local economy or very little to the local economy and then they go home. They don't contribute to destination marketing, they don't contribute to promoting tourism in the area. So we, we had a lot of evidence presented to us to state that. They said that these forms of accommodation drive up the housing costs for a lot of their staff. So sometimes their staff can only secure rental accommodation for six months of the year. And then in the other six months of the year, during the holiday season, their staff are booted out and they have to drive two hours every day. They have to come down from Bunbury in order to provide cleaning or hospitality services in Margaret River, for example. Um, a lot of uh, short-stay accommodation providers told us that they're having to lay people off and that's, that's obviously tragic for, for those communities. They also highlighted dangers to consumers um, around standards of, uh, of uh, building qualities, um, the fire risk um, and insurance and public liability issues. So all of this is on the public record so, so I'd encourage you to have a look through the submissions. Um, that gives you a flavour for what the traditional accommodation providers were saying. Then there was the property owners, the people who do own and operate hosted and unhosted properties. There were two, again, two distinct groups, actually three. Um, the host of people who have a spare room in their house, who, who just want to make a little bit more money and they, they, put, they list their rooms, it's a very small proportion now of, of this market. There's the unhosted people who maybe have a holiday house down south or they might have an investment property which they haven't been able to long term rent and they want to list it on Airbnb. There's only, and they're small, they're mum and dad investors. And then there are people who have 
they're building a business out of this. They've got multiple properties. Some people have 10, 15, 20 of these properties, and it really is a commercial operation that they are that they're running. Now they say it's positive to the local economy. So we've had one group say this is terrible for the economy, and these this group mentioned that it's very positive. It supports local cafes, they encourage people to have local experiences, to visit local tourism destinations, they say it encourages tourism. It provides people obviously with an income. And for a lot of retirees, it supplements their income. And a whole heap of, and I was interested to understand this, 52% of the owners of these properties are women. And a lot of those women are either divorcees or widows. So it provides an income stream for women, and particularly women in their later years, who we all know really struggle to find employment. There's undoubtedly ageism and difficulties that older women have re-entering the workforce. This provides an income stream for them. Um, they also uh, emphasise that hosted accommodation in particular provides a very authentic experience. A really, you, you're living with locals, you're experiencing locals, so they really emphasise how it really helps people to experience life, not just visit a town. These opportunities have also given rise to a whole heap of new business models. There are now property management agencies that just deal in short-term rentals, and there's a whole new business model out there, there's a whole heap of um, ancillary industries that do the cleaning and manage the security. So there's a whole little, a new burgeoning industry being built about this. Next really important group is the neighbours. And I must say, I, I've got to declare an interest here, I'm a neighbour. I am wittingly bought a house that about a month after I moved in over the Easter period, I realised was an Airbnb when about seven carloads of kids turned up. And I was like, wow, what on earth have I gotten myself into? So, so I'm very, you know, as, as a neighbour. And then like every weekend, different cars pull in, different cars pull out. You don't know who your neighbours are. So neighbours, um, particularly neighbours in really residential areas that have not tourism precincts, they're residential areas, they are experiencing amenity issues. There, there are party houses. There are commercial venues. We, we had a submission from a, from a lady who owns an acreage in, in Ballsbrook who um, lives next door to a beautiful country house that is operated as a commercial venue. So they had the Nando's Christmas party next to her house. And all these cars rolled up and DJs and Nando's catering, of course. And, um, and she said, this is happening now all the time. The, the house is now for sale being advertised as a commercial venue. And she lives on a place in a beautiful part of the world that she moved to, to enjoy the peace and quiet and the amenity of living in the hills. And I might be a little bit biased because that's where I live. And, um, and I know why we live there. We live there for, to enjoy the amenity and the, and the peace. People talk to us about their, people bringing their dogs on holiday and leaving the dogs in the backyard and the dogs bark and they throw the dog poo over the fence and they can't get parking on the street because one house has got five cars turning up. Like all these issues around amenity. Um, but then we are on oh, apartments. Apartments, entire floors of apartments, or you buy an apartment and find out all of a sudden the five apartments surrounding you are Airbnb apartments. Or you go up to use the pool on the rooftop because, you know, it's part of your strata agreement and all of a sudden you find there's a teenage party up there because someone's renting an apartment on a different floor and they now have full access to the building. So, so there are all these issues around common facilities in, um, in apartment complexes and the, again, the, the level of security and how, how much amenity that may erode from you. There was also um, a suggestion, although I don't think, or you'll have to read the report a little more, but there was also a, a suggestion that apartment buildings are now emerging that are just for Airbnb. And, um, and I would say that if you review the evidence, I don't think that there's been any concrete evidence put to us that that is happening in WA, but nonetheless there are those who raise that as an issue. Then we have the holiday makers, the ones who love the choice, 
the ones who want to be able to go away with their family and experience a home away from home. They want to take their dog. They want to take the kids and have the kids be able to put down to, to be put to bed at night and they can all have a cooked meal, they can share um, the living room together and it's a home away from home and large family groups that like to travel together. If you've got a family of four kids, mum and dad, you've got to hire two or three hotel rooms if you all want to go away on holiday together becomes very expensive and it's a barrier to a lot of Australian families then getting away on holiday together. So the holiday makers like the choice, they like something that's affordable and accessible holiday making. Um, they like this, this home away from home. Then there's the local government authorities and they're a right mixed bag. Um, they're, they're, they're very varied responses. In the more mature markets like Fremantle, they seem to have really gotten their heads around this and they've got frameworks in place and it seems to be all ticking along. Other markets, it's really complicated and it's it's like a bow wave of complexity and community angst being directed against them and they don't know whether they should use their local planning policies or their local planning schemes or their local laws and it's creating all sorts of difficulties and then different governments who decide they're going to respond then d respond differently. So it is, it's becoming this patchwork, this sort of cacophony of different policy responses and that makes it very difficult for people who want to buy places to know exactly what it is they've got to comply with and I think it's, it's making it um, very difficult for the state government to respond as well. A lot of local government authorities though see this as a bridge. They see it as a way of encouraging tourism into their local areas and they're interested in the economic uh, development opportunities. Um, you know, some, Margaret River and, and uh, Busselton though, we were seeing that they're really worried about the economic impacts that this is having and the fact that it's killing off their town. We, went, we spoke to Albany and they said not an issue, not even an issue in Albany. And so it's incredibly varied responses. Then we had the community sectors, a big issue that I've been very uh, uh, in, um, focused on pursuing is about housing affordability. I am very worried to hear that in other cities around the world, and indeed now we're seeing it in Tasmania and uh, also in some New South Wales coastal towns, that locals can't afford to live in their local area and that locals are basically being forced out of town and city centres because housing is no longer affordable. They've been crowded out by short stay accommodation and I'm very worried about, about that issue in particular. Um, and then there were the platforms themselves. And um, uh, broadly, um, well, they're obviously very in favour of retaining this sort of business model in, in Western Australia, but I do, uh, and they obviously want the least possible forms of government intervention, but nonetheless, I do think that they have acknowledged the need um, to manage in some way, shape or form this new disruptive technology. So what are the options? I can't tell you, because we're still workshopping it, and as I say, I don't want to end up in jail, but uh, there were three words that kept coming up over and over and over again and it's like level playing field, level playing field, that, that just kept coming up over and over again. So the question is, what is a level playing field? Do we want to deliver one? How do we deliver one? And I think the key part of, of answering those questions, I think what I'll do is I'll, rather than, I'm going to pose to you a series of questions that are on the committee's mind because I can't tell you what we're actually thinking. <laughs> First thing is, what is the role of the state government? What, what is it that the state government can actually do in this space? The first thing, we, the state government's concerned with macro factors. The state government's thinking about consumer protection and safety. It's thinking about insurances. It's thinking about what's gonna grow the tourism sector. What are the planning and land use implications more broadly across the state? So these macro level economic development type policy and consumer protection type issues. And then what's the role of local government? They're very focused on the micro level. They are focused on amenity impacts, what it means for them in terms of providing community services, community facilities, roads, rubbish, rates. That's the, that's the concerns of, of local government and more broadly what it means for planning and land use within their particular jurisdictions. And of course, both the state and federal government are very attuned to the wants and desires of their constituents. And I've got a whole new appreciation of that in the last two years. We do know that we need better information, um, but before we run off and say we want all this information, I think that we need to be very clear about why we need the information and in what ways are we already gathering information. And if we get it, 
to what purposes do we apply it? And those are the sorts of questions that the, uh, that the committee is considering at the moment. There are also instruments available. Um, what instruments are there? Well, there's local planning schemes, local planning policies, local laws, there's model provisions for strata bylaws, there's, there's model provisions in local government mechanisms. There are other forms of intervention that the state government has available to it. And, and we will be considering that as part of our, um, our uh, process. So in conclusion, I think it boils down to what are our core considerations and I, and I think you can bring them down into three key things. How can we balance these clearly complex and, of, uh, and often diametrically opposed sets of interests? How do we develop recommendations that are fair, sensible, practical and most importantly workable? And how well, how do we allow the state to do its job? whilst allowing local governments to account for often significantly different local conditions. That's come through loud and clear to us in the inquiry. These are core questions in respect to short stay accommodation, but thinking more broadly, they apply across so many portfolios these days. This topic underscores the need for state government agencies to work together on very complex topics that cross a number of portfolios. It's shown the need to ensure that state level initiatives don't have unintended local consequences. WA is a diverse state and I don't think one size necessarily fits all. It's shown the need for governments at all levels to listen to the community's voices and not just the loudest ones in the room. And finally, it's highlighted the need for all of us, for government, industry, research institutions and community to work together, engage constructively in these debates to come up with effective, positive public policy outcomes. Thank you. Well, after um, Jessica's talk, I'm going to try not to put you to sleep. <laughs> it's really hard uh, to follow that. Look, uh, Margaret River is an interesting uh, community. It's, it's, an, it's a community that's experienced strong population growth for the last couple of decades. And as a planner, I've never worked out why. Because there's not a lot of industry growth in, in Margaret River apart from tourism. The vineyards, the wine industry, is that wine industry established itself in the early 80s and late 80s. But as a planner, I used to work for the state government doing regional planning. And I couldn't work out why Margaret River would be continue to grow, but it has, against all predictions. It's continued to grow, and it's currently got a population of 15,700 people, which means that most of the people that live in the Shire of Margaret River weren't born there, didn't grow up there, they've moved there from somewhere else. And they have a different connection to the community than the people that live there, the traditional agricultural people. Um, it's quite, it makes it a very dynamic community and in some ways quite a divided community. And people continue to move there. Every year we approve 250 new houses and we've done that for the last nearly decade. 250 new houses every year in the Shire of Augusta, Margaret River, mostly in Margaret River and uh, with about 50 in Quarima, which is by, by percentage the fastest growing town in WA. From about 150 people, it's now around 2,000 people. So the communities are changing, they're evolving. And uh, working in local government, we find it quite a challenge. We have to sort of try and understand these, these communities and the new people arriving and what their needs are. We have a median age of 39, which is slightly above the state average, but it's not universal. In Augusta, the median age is 59. So quite different. I think Quarum Up's about 35, same as the state. A young, dynamic community compared to quite an ageing one. Um, and look, we, we, the interesting thing about the rents, I was looking, we have a thing called Community ID. You can go onto our website, it's on the Shire website. Many local governments have it. We pay a firm to give us a snapshot of the economic profile, community profile for, for this thing. And while I was on it uh, today, I found our average rental price was $317 a week. The average mortgage payment is $410 a week. So it's not too bad. 
But at times there is a real shortage of rental accommodation in our town and I personally experienced that when I moved back to Margaret River to work. We were finding ourselves queuing up trying to find houses because it was coming into the summer season. So we know that the statistics don't tell the whole story. It tells part of the story, but not everything. Um, we know there is a fairly low uh, uh, percentage of people that rent in the, in the Shire, though. 27% of people rent. So there's quite a, a, a much higher uh, degree of home ownership. And 34% of people have mortgages. So a lot of people own their own homes. They don't have a mortgage. Uh, We've got 5,655, this is the census, this is 2018 statistics from ID, 5,655 occupied dwellings, and 2,081 are unoccupied. And they're mostly Perth people who come down occasionally. Some of them don't even come down every month. So these things sit, and they're mostly in Augusta, Preverly, Narrabup, and Gracetown, uh, which is almost vacant. Uh, for half the year. Uh, they're coastal communities. The locals have sold out of these communities. They've taken the money and run and moved into more affordable accommodation in Margaret River and often live mortgage free. But the communities are quite different because they have this high numbers of, of, of vacant houses through the year. They're not out there on Airbnb and they're not rented out. The people are not interested in renting these things. They're interested in coming down and having a holiday every now and then or letting their families stay. So for us, holiday houses has a completely different connotation to Airbnb. We talk about hosted and unhosted accommodation. Holiday houses are the vacant ones for the rich people, the Peppy Grove people, you know, the Cottesloe said. <laughs> and, you know, and, and again, many of our new houses are built for people who are not intending to live in them permanently, maybe until they retire. We do find people come down and they retire, they hold the home for several years, for maybe a decade, and eventually they do retire into our community. So there's a good thing about it, there's, it's not all bad. The people bring a wealth of experience and we have some amazing people who are retirees in our shire, who have moved to our shire. Um, we have a huge, a very high rate of volunteer, volunteerism as a result, and I think it's because of that, the, the type of people that to choose to retire to our shire. With our holiday homes, we've got, we have 242 in total ho registered holiday homes. And for a small community, a relatively small community, that's a lot. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge impact, particularly when you start looking at the impact on the, on the registered accommodation providers, the, the, the guest houses. 74 of them are bed and breakfast and 24 of them, oh sorry, we have 74 bed and breakfast, the hosted accommodation and 24 guest houses, which are more the traditional type. From January to April, we approved 54, but of those, 28 were renewals. We have a different system in Margaret River. We use our planning scheme to regulate holiday homes. They only get approved for two years because uh, although they have a right to be guaranteed if they comply with the policy, or a guaranteed right to be re-approved if they comply with, with the policies and the rules, we can also choose not to, re, uh, to renew them if they don't apply the rules. So we, 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 we try and use our biggest stick to regulate them in the Shire of uh, uh, Busselton to the north, they use a local policy. It has the same effect, we just find that the penalties are higher with the planning scheme than they are with a local law. I think it's $500 local law, $250,000 planning scheme, so we thought $250 sounds scary and we'll use that instead. And they do, it, it is quite effective at, at times, it gives us uh, uh, quite a lot of um, yeah, uh, more presence. We, we renewed one guest house, we used the same and, uh, um, uh, process. Now we did have a lot of concern about unregistered holiday homes, uh, the, the unregistered, particularly the unhosted uh, accommodation. We were getting a lot of complaints from uh, the registered accommodation providers but other people as well saying, look, these things are getting a little out of control. So we employed 
a temporary compliance officer. In addition to our planning staff, we also have two lawyers work for us full time in the Shire. From, uh, uh, but we employed this person for six months, for two days a week, and they spent the whole time chasing down holiday homes. They found 50 that were unapproved and uh, we issued 26 $500 infringements, six warnings, and six, 16 of them had disappeared by the time they, they, the person got to them, obviously heard they were coming. But we sent letters out and the letters pretty well said, if you don't stop, we'll give you a $250,000 fine, we'll take you to court, <laughs> please stop. Um, we have four that we know are still going that we've that we've identified and they've refused to stop and they'll end up in the court and uh, hopefully we'll get a reasonable penalty, a penalty from them. But the other thing we did was we changed our local planning policy and the, we made a presentation, a submission to the, uh, on this. Council decided they couldn't wait. They wanted to do something now. They wanted to change the rules. Originally they decided they wanted to change our planning scheme. And as planners, we said, well, that's fine, but it will take a long time. The minister has to approve that. It has to go to the WAPC. It will take you at least two years to change that if the, if the WAPC agrees, if the minister agrees, you'll get it changed. Or we could put in a new planning policy. But we have to be balanced. If we go over the top then, and it's appealed, we'll lose the appeal. So we put together our, our short stay planning, uh, uh, short stay accommodation policy, and we met with three different groups. Oh, sorry, we met. We met with two groups, and someone else met with a third group, and I'll tell you why in a sec. So the first group was the tourism operators, the people that benefit from accommodation, whether it's through unhosted, hosted, registered hotels, and they gave us a viewpoint. Then we met with the registered accommodation people. And they gave us a, view, a viewpoint. I think there were around 50 people in each of those groups. We had another person, because they wouldn't meet with us, meet with unregistered accommodation providers, the illegal people, and there are about 38 people turned up to that. But we got the outcomes and we put together a draft policy. And everyone had different views, obviously, but we decided that we would restrict holiday homes from the residential type areas where it was important to keep, we, we wanted to keep the amenity well and keep the rents low. And we would uh, restrict some of the smaller lot rural residential areas, uh, 2,000 square metre lots and up to 4,000. So we, where we were getting complaints about when people applied for new holiday homes to try and preserve the amenity of the areas. We identified areas where we thought they'd be fine. And they were all areas that were previously allowed, that we didn't introduce them into any new areas. We said, well, the coastal areas where there's a high number of vacant houses, we don't mind them being there because it might actually attract more people into those areas. And it had been promoted in the past in those areas. We took out a lot of, or some elements, where the, the policy, the previous policy we'd had was quite ambiguous. You could either be in an area or you could meet some criteria. And, and planning consultants are fantastic. They're like lawyers. They can, they can make an argument out of, um, uh, if something's quite loose, they'll make an argument to, dis to say this is allowed. So we, we, we took that out. We removed the ambigu ambiguity. And um, that's been really successful, but there was a bad element to it. In the time we were doing the consultation, we had the largest number ever of holiday home approvals because people knew we were going to tighten up the rules and they got in first. So we had a spike of, a, of, of holiday home applications coming through to us and for a while it was all we could see were holiday home applications, people getting in under the, under the old policy. So you've got to be careful when you introduce new rules. You can often lead to worse outcomes in the, in the lead up to the rules than what you get if you continued on with the old ones. We think we got it right. We're waiting for the parliamentary inquiry to tell us where the new direction is and then we'll respond once we know and, and once the new legislation, regulations are drafted and that will take quite some time, we'll know what we can do further. But the other thing we're doing, we've engaged with Curtin University and ECU 
and hopefully Professor Brown can tell you more about what they're doing, to look at the impacts on our community. Our community are cha is changing. But this is one of the changes. The Airbnb syndrome, the, the, the holiday home, is changing our community and there may be positive and negative impacts on local communities. But we would like to know what it's doing to our community, how people are responding, what's going on, so that we can inform ourselves, but also so we can pass the information on to the state government in the future. We're not in a hurry because we want the information to be good. We want it to be robust because it's not a problem that's going to go away tomorrow. It's, it's a change. We don't know if it's a short term, a medium term, a very long term change. But we'd like to understand what it's doing to our community and put it in the context of the other changes I've talked about, the rapid population growth, the new people coming into town. And hopefully we'll get a better understanding of where our community is going. Thank you. Yes, good evening and thank you everyone and I uh, would like to uh, acknowledge this rather, the rather large team who's working on this, uh, including uh, uh, Prof uh, Associate Professor Hadrian Jodo de Carter, uh, Professor Dora Marinova from Curtin University who's with us tonight, Associate Professor Ferry G, um, Dr Edmund Goh, Dr Uma Jogaloo <coughs> and our PhD student who's working on it, uh, Meg Snaguba. So we um, are very keen to um, be involved in this process and uh, tonight was a great opportunity for me to air my photos of Margaret River for my last holiday. Uh, so I, uh, I think that I, I would like to talk more globally about tourism and talk about the opportunities and talk about some of the issues and highlight where we're going with uh, some of our research. And for short stay accommodation, uh, it's, it's, it's very important that we have uh, visitor infrastructures. So this isn't uh, an insignificant part of it. You can see the beautiful uh, natural landscapes, for, but for us to be visitors within that uh, economy, we need uh, infrastructures that support the way that we would like to be in that community and the way in which we can travel uh, according to our uh, beliefs and needs and, and constellations that we bring to that community. And it's not just holiday makers, it's actually business community and business visitors as well who come to different regions. Um, but what we also know from our early work is that regulation is an important element of this. It's not just about red tape, it's about making uh, a visitor experience memorable, safe and, uh, and orderly in a way that you can actually enjoy yourself. But knowing that you are a visitor to a community and I think this is an important element for us in thinking through what has to happen. That it's not about no regulation, but it's about importantly developing a regulatory approach that supports what's going on in different regions. And as you've heard from uh, both Dale and uh, Jessica, that there are different pressures and different responses in each community. And so as we've looked through, uh, what are the responses to, for example, Airbnb, because that's the big issue uh, for a lot of people, is that in small communities, this is uh, an important contributor to their economic development. And in, in large communities like Sydney, then there's a way of regulating where they can actually say no they can say that these are stricter regulations that we can have on this uh, uh, type of accommodation provision and that this is important to us. So it's not just about an overall regulation but a sensitive regulation that responds to each individual community's needs. And I think the other aspect of this is that innovative providers always jump ahead of the game. That Airbnb 
moved in as a platform provider the way in which we see disruptive technology moving into existing industries ahead of the game like the taxi industry. The taxi industry was requested to lift their game. They felt that their regulation and their registration kept them insulated and, Airbnb, and, and Uber came underneath and swept away all their well-rehearsed arguments because they could just do it. And this is what we're finding with uh, uh, these platform providers, that they can move in very adaptive and agile ways through the legislation and, um, and get ahead of the game. And what we do for that then is part of our research to understand how that works. Okay, so overall we see that tourism and the visitor economy is a significant driver and um, particularly for national development but we also see for regional development. And I know Sam Huang is in the audience and he does a lot of work with understanding the Chinese, visiting, uh, Chinese visitors and the visitor economy, particularly in relation to that cohort. And uh, I think we also know that it's um, an important way of developing our um, economic uh, our, our economic response to economic issues and so as Dale mentioned that tourism is one of the biggest industries and yet we wouldn't see it as an industry in terms of um, output and manu like we see manufacturing, we see all kinds of activity that sits in what we see as economic activity, but certainly tourism in regions is one of the biggest uh, contributors. So we have these um, we have these ways of building our economy and in fact tourists and um, uh, economic development have been coming together. And I know I was uh, uh, Professor of uh, uh, Tourism uh, in, in um, Queensland at the Gold Coast. That's a good place to be a Professor of uh, Tourism uh, at the Gold Coast. And the debates in economic development were that tourism didn't fit economic development. And a lot of our time was spent actually trying to get tourism on the agenda along with infrastructure, along with manufacturing, along with a range of other hard-nosed activities uh, for our economy. So you can see that the, the debate spreads across the, um, that spectrum of the fact that A, we, we look to tourism for economic development, but we also are, are fighting the good fight about putting tourism into an economic development framework. And so we see that that's quite an amount of money. And when we look at what's happening in the share across Australia, we see that Western Australia sort of sits in the middle. That um, we see that Queensland, sorry, we see that uh, Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria have quite a big share. So for us here in uh, uh, the West, we see those Eastern Staters as doing something quite different and uh, we have such a beautiful state over here, it's like, well, come to WA, you'll find out how beautiful it is. Um, so you see that we have a smaller share around about the middle. Um, but what this means is that we look to economic development through tourism as one of the drivers of, of an, an economic regeneration and uh, we see that there's space and scope for us to use visitation and use the visitor economy as an important driver. So we're sort of not at full yet. You can see uh, with Sydney, with uh, New South Wales, Sydney actually gets full. You can't get a hotel room in Sydney for love and money, uh, even if it is a lot of money, uh, you can't do it. And so they see that uh, this isn't the case here in WA, and so there's opportunities. Now how do we develop those opportunities? That's really important because in the tourism industry uh, in Western Australia, I can say that we are hurting. 
we, we're, we're not there yet in terms of filling up our accommodation. I, I'm sure some of the accommodation providers are seeing Airbnb and some of the great big hotel uh, developments with, with a bit of trepidation and uh, I'm sure we'll get time for questions and issues to raise about this mix, how we do this. And so also in our research, we see this level playing field coming up as an issue. How do we manage and, and have a, a level playing field? Uh, is it possible to have a level playing field? What does a level playing field look like? The same questions that the parliamentary inquiry have struggled with. And also, we also think that there should be room for innovation in this space that it's very important that we keep it alive because what we see is that we're not just competing with each other for spaces, we're competing in the Asian region, we're competing against Bali, we're competing against other kinds of areas that are just not in Western Australia. They're actually outside our West Australian borders and we see that we need to be competitive, whatever that means. And so that's quite an important element. So here's uh, Airbnb, and we see that again we're sort of in the middle, but we see from Western Australia that uh, it, it has been growing, and uh, you can see there the share of um, guests, bookings, and uh, total nights booked. So, and that was 2015-16, and it's gone up a lot since, it's gone up since then. Uh, this was a study by Deloitte's. And so we see that, uh, yeah, that Tasmania, small as it is, but a very uh, important tourism destination, uh, has sort of on, on par with us. So what does that mean? We're either very well regulated in terms of understanding uh, where Airbnb fits in the picture or there's room for more or there's room for other kinds of operations. So what does that mean? It means we need to look harder about what's happening with that. But you can see in New South Wales, uh, they have a very high uh, number of um, nights and a very high number of visitors that are using Airbnb. And then you can see why Sydney has uh, banned um, un and put under strict regulation for Sydney itself, Airbnb. And they uh, are allowing hosted but not the unhosted. And they're allowed to be out. So around about Blacktown outwards, if you'd like to stay in Blacktown outwards, you're very welcome to have Airbnb um, a comp type accommodation on offer and use it. So you can see where their policy prescriptions are going to restrict the unhosted, to make the hosted more um, accessible within Sydney and to also move out those air, the Airbnb into uh, the, the regions further out. So what are the challenges and issues then? And they have been um, raised in the parliamentary inquiry, but they've also been raised in the literature. And we uh, looked across the literature on a global sense and that we found that uh, there's crowding out as uh, it's been raised before. And it's just not crowding out um, of um, local providers, it's crowding out in, in the rental uh, areas and uh, causing issues within local communities. And there's also uh, increased pressure on long stay uh, accommodation, so the rental, the general rental, and we also see that uh, there's a general shift uh, from community residents to a visitor economy. Now, that may be uh, important as communities uh, age and uh, young people move away, but it may be very uh, destructive to uh, to communities that rely on um, a vibrant community and not have 50% uh, uh, occupancy for, for part of the year. Where do the local shops build their income? Where do the local uh, providers actually get their income? They may as well go on holidays themselves for six months of the year. It's very important to see that um, 
that building uh, across a year and uh, how that affects local communities. We also see that um, the traditional options for short stay, which are the service departments, the inns, the motels and hotels, they're in a, usually in a specific commercial location. And this has been raised as well, that it changes the amenities of local communities if there are accommodation providers in residential areas. And those problems are, are reported globally. So it's not just the Margaret River problem, and it's not just the South West or the Western Australian problem, it's a global problem uh, that communities are utterly changed by having a visitor community on your doorstep. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, we think that there is uh, a way of uh, developing appropriate regulation, uh, but that mix is uh, not yet clear to us that um, there's, there needs to be uh, mechanisms for dispute resolution, important uh, dispute resolution, uh, ways of being able to bring the parties together. And I see that the parliamentary inquiry and, and what's happening in Margaret River have started to do that, to try and bring people together. I think that um, tourism is one of the economic generators, but I think it's the tourism experience and the hosted uh, is very important to bring people together and share their community and share their culture and share their lifestyle. But we also need to think of the overall socioeconomic well-being of residents within a community. And also, we, we see that peripheral regions can support uh, certain um, other kinds of accommodation because they can't afford the tourism infrastructure that, re that is required for hotels and large-scale infrastructure. So this is kind of a soft landing to bring um, tourism to those peripheral regions. Also that overzealous re regulations may be counterproductive. Uh, we see in Barcelona where the um, licensing fee increased from 250 euro to 80,000. Now, no matter how much you see uh, that Airbnb makes money for people, they can't bring that, that just cuts it out completely. Also, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, the council imposed a $500,000 liability. And again, that's a number that's just out of the range of people who um, are offering their houses for Airbnb. So it does close it down completely. Is that what they wanted? Well, this is what you have to take care of when you try to be try to have a regulatory response and be overzealous about it. It might be that those communities uh, like New York don't mind; they can withstand it. But if you have a small community and this one size all regulation comes across the top, it will close down. And is that what you want? Maybe you don't like Airbnb, but maybe as the Margaret River example has shown that there can be zones in which Airbnb certainly fits and with proper regulation you can have a mix of accommodation. Thank you. In Western Australia what we've found is that um, there are accurate enough macro figures but as soon as you start diving down into the um, you know into the more micro level it gets very very murky about who's collecting that data and under what conditions so um, I wouldn't say that it's misrepresented but what I'm saying is that it's very difficult to collect that micro level data so overall we have, um, I think, fairly accurate macro data and very big differences between regions. Mm -hmm. So that's what we found. And what TRA does is, is sort of have aggregation at certain levels and so that makes it difficult for us, particularly as researchers, to unpick the rest of that underneath. The same with the ABS data. There's very, very good macro level data, but when you want to drill down and get into that finer grain uh, detail, 
it's very, very difficult to sort of pull it all together and understand what what uh, is going on at that granular level. So I take your point, and part of the uh, work that we're trying to do is build up a better picture about what's going on at that granular level. And uh, I, you know, it would be uh, very important to see if the ABS and TRA, because they use each other's data to be able to get a better, clearer picture, particularly for WA. For some reason, WA, it's um, very difficult to get migration data, very difficult to get uh, drilled down. Individuals, councils often have very good data, actually, but it doesn't come back up again necessarily. So it, yeah, it's an important question. I wouldn't say that it's misrepresented, but there are ways of looking at data and ways of aggregating that data that, that may give give you uh, particular perspectives. Did you want to More questions now. There are two people on this side. Uh, I, I have a question for Ms. Jessica Jin Shao. So I, I think I didn't hear the definition of short-term accommodation. So it's like one week, one month, three months, six months. Is the same for different industries? Like hotel, Airbnb. Yeah, I want to know that. Could yeah. You, could, you, could, you, could you state your name and organization? Uh, my name is Ying, and I come from uh, South South Park, and I'm an agent. Okay. Thank you. So it's actually a very good question, and it's one that the committee spent a lot of time uh, mulling over. Um, what we have. What, what we, what the way we've approached it is that uh, there is a short-term or short-stay accommodation industry, if you like, and it's not long-term rentals and it's not home ownership. There is a whole industry now around short-stay accommodation, and it is provided by um, traditional providers, so small B and B registered operators, um, and the traditional large scale, larger scale hoteliers hotels, motels, the traditional licensed registered businesses. And then we are looking, we've, we've, we have, and, and obviously this could or may or may not be a disputed term, we've then categorised short-term rentals. And uh, Airbnb and, or the online platforms, we categorise as short-term rentals. And within short-term rentals, there are then two further subcategories hosted where it's a room within a building or unhosted, where it's a standalone apartment or holiday home or house. So, so broadly, that's, that's the way that the committee has chosen to, uh, on the evidence, that seems to us to be a way that we have chosen to look at the issue. Um, that, that, as I say, that's reflected on the evidence that's been presented to us. I'm not sure how consistent that is with you know, academic peer-reviewed literature on the, on the topic. But that's the way we've chosen to divvy it up. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> you have a, a follow-up question? Or are you okay with that? Okay, please sit down. Hopefully this one will be answered. <laughs> um, this is probably directed towards uh, Jessica Dale. Uh, Steve Crawford, on, uh, uh, my day job is with the Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, but I also support ECU by way of uh, representation on the hospitality and tourism industry a consultative group. Uh, I've been involved in this industry for over 39 years of my life, and I can tell you right now that the disruption from Airbnb, in my view, is fairly mild. Um, this industry is characterised by disruption, and I've been, I, can give you, I can give you case study after case study after case study study of disruptors. Um, but my question is really philosophical more than anything else, it is um, in doing the sort of work that you are doing, is how do you balance up the need to protect, protect existing businesses with the need to create opportunity for innovation in the future and, and guide new industries that we don't even know about now? That, that's the core of this issue and, and I think as I made the, the observation I made in, in my concluding comments is this is a case study, this is, this is a window into what's happening in so many sectors of the economy now. Um, I would dispute 
the, the mild impact. I, one of the things that's come through loud and clear is that there are mild impacts in some parts of the world and really significant impacts in others. And that's one of the, the real challenges. And to go directly to your second question, the challenge is how do we balance those competing issues that you raise when they're having differential impacts in so many different communities? So I, I was at pains to describe, to, to emphasize that one size doesn't fit all. There is clearly an issue in the southwest of Western Australia. There is clearly some, a, a very, um, I don't know whether it's because of the maturity of the, of the short stay accommodation sector there. I don't know, I thought I was very interested to hear about the industry comments that Dale made, that tourism really is, there's no other real industrial base down there. Um, but it, it, look, if I had the answer to that question, the report would be tabled. <laughs> and and it, is, it is something we're grappling with in real time. And as you quite rightly point out, it is affecting a number of sectors. And at the end of the day, um, we obviously want to ensure the continued economic prosperity. Uh, the parliamentary inquiry that I'm chairing at the moment into microgrids reflects the fact that electricity is no, no longer produced and consumed in the way it used to be. We used to have these thumping great power stations that pushed electricity out to passive end users. That is no longer the case. There are all sorts of new business models that are emerging and the trick is to understand, well, where is the economic opportunity? How do we facilitate that? And how do we make sure that everybody gets to share in the benefits of it? Because it would be a tragedy indeed if one part of the economy, and particularly if a lot of the revenue goes overseas and isn't returned to the people of Western Australia, that would be a tragedy too. So it's how do we strike the balance right to make sure that you recognise that significant investments have been made, that economies are in transition, but that we all need and deserve to share in the benefits. That, that's what policymakers are grappling with. And I'm only two years into this job, so I'm sorry I don't have all the answers yet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jess. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, it's Mandy from SPN Strata. Did you get much feedback from PIFO guys that are going to stay at short term? Because my brother, um, he's recently taken off to FIFO and he used to live in their sprints and a lot of the gentlemen down there would come back to their families or go up to Bali because it was cheaper to stay. But his feedback is that there's a lot of FIFO people that are taking advantage of Airbnb because they can drop and pick their, their choice of, um, you know, depending on their timetable or if they're on um, a, a contract, a short term contract. Surprisingly, no, and I specifically contacted the towns of Port Hedland and Caratha um, to tease that issue out, to see if it was an alternative accommodation option in those towns, because obviously quite a live debate at the moment about whether we continue to put FIFO workers in temporary accommodation camps or whether we allow workers to have access to more homely type um, arrangements when they go to the towns where the mining operations are. So, yeah, which I'm coming to, which, I, which I'm coming to. So no is the short answer. We didn't have much feedback, at, I had nothing from, from FIFO workers saying that, you know, they want a period of time where they use a house in Perth and then when they're off on swing or when they go away on holiday, we didn't get that sort of evidence. But if, you, if anybody wants me to uh, ask a question about strata, um, that is fascinating and um, and uh, so yeah think of starter questions <laughs> hi I'm Florian Hi I'm from the Transport Society but it's not necessarily related to I'm here in an independent role I guess. I'm just curious uh, there is another trend maybe not as significant than Airbnb but there is this thing, I'm not sure exactly the, word, the right wording, but people are sharing their houses. So they go to a site, and there they meet, there are other people registered, that they are basically sharing houses. So I go to Europe, and someone from Europe comes to stay in my house, and I can do that many times a year. What if this would be taking, you know, proportion and would be quite a trend and quite significant? Would that be the same concern as the Airbnb? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the question is about timeshare, right? Yeah, so yeah, house share. Uh, so do you know people are sharing share? their houses? Yes. This, is not, this hasn't come up in the context of the inquiry, so I will hand over to my colleagues. Oh, I'll, I'll start by saying, look, we 
don't even try and regulate our share. Uh, it would be almost impossible because people don't advertise it. It's not a commercial operation. So it, it, it's often done, you know, via social networks or, or friends of, and it's been happening for such a long time. Um, for, where, where we get involved, local government, we look at commercial operations, whether it's a, a sh uh, unhosted accommodation, hosted accommodation, guest house, or, or, or whatever the style of accommodation, it has to have a commercial element. People are, are, are paying, and generally they're booking through one or other of, of, of a number of means. Lately, they're getting online, what if, stays, Airbnb, there are a whole suite of online booking services that, um, that you can use to book. Used to be through the tourism bureaus, and that's where we're finding the biggest impact for us. The tourism bureaus are really suffering because people are no longer booking through the tourism bureaus. Mm -hmm. They're going online, or they're even going direct to the provider through their own websites, through the provider's websites. So, yeah, but house sharing? No, you, we, we haven't even looked at. In, uh, in our research, we see uh, that as part of the sharing economy. So it is of interest to us to, to see how the sharing economy works. And it sort of sits around that idea about hosted uh, accommodation where you share the experience of being in a community. But um, trying to track the numbers and, and the, the proportion of people doing that is, is quite difficult. So we are interested in it as part of thinking through the sharing economy because it is a share and there is a broker in the middle of that. So there's a mediating institution of the payment to a, um, a third party, um, but very hard to get the, the data on that. So Yeah, my name is Sam Huang from the uh, School of Business and Law in Seoul University. Uh, my question is mainly derived from some academic research, and uh, mm, I would like, especially Dale, uh, to provide some insights uh, from the government, local government perspective. Uh, in the tourism re research literature, we have uh, the uh, tourism-led economic growth as a hypothesis, and a lot of uh, researchers have um, done some empirical uh, verification of the hypothesis. Still, um, uh, we, we found that if we put uh, the local uh, system uh, as an economist, uh, economy, uh, whether tourism can really contribute to uh, economic growth. Um, my colleagues, some of my colleagues from China, um, we, we did some empirical studies, at least the two major studies can tell the story, but it's mainly based on some local economies in China. We found that um, the, uh, the first study was, uh, uh, you know, the tourism growth is not linear, and then uh, it, it's, it com uh, corresponds to the development stage of the destination. Uh, but I would like to focus on the second study. In the second study, we found that productivity, actually labor productivity in different sectors in the local economy would really make a difference in different stages of uh, uh, economy's um, development. Tourism would play a different role and then in, if we define tourism as a sector, and then this sector's labor productivity will fit into the whole region's uh, economic growth. Um, I just don't want to know because Airbnb would be a kind of technology uh, in, or technological innovation which we can fit into the economic model other than labor, capital, and land. Um, though I would like to, to seek your view, maybe your experience of uh, uh, your region's development so far, uh, whether you see this Airbnb model, the, the, the current application in your region, 
can really change the region's sectoral productivity. But it's still quite fussy because we can't really, because Airbnb is actually disrupting the existing uh, industry systems. You know, we can't really see, it. It, it, it can be an emerging sector, but how can we defend with a clear boundary of the tourism sector? But just to see um, whether you can see this can increase or not really necessarily in, uh, increase the labor productivity in this sector. Maybe it's a question for them. Yeah, I didn't get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to, maybe it won't answer the question, but I'll try. Um, we, because our region has experienced rapid growth with new people coming in, we've had a, a change in our economy. So our largest economic sector is still agriculture, but it's declining because we're losing more agricultural land. Some of the farms are getting bigger as people are buying up. I think there's a Malaysian court and consortium buying up five farms at the moment, but that's just, they're only one I know about, but that's happening across the, the, the region. In, in the wheat belt, there are large consortiums buying up farms, amalgamating them. On the other side of the spectrum, we have people moving into our region that are very interested in small lot production. Mm. They don't want the large lots, they want small lots, they want to produce for the local community and make a living out of that. We have people coming in that want to offer tourism activities. The difficulty is that when they do that, they often take agricultural, productive agricultural land out of production and use it for a different purpose. So it's a change. Often, it's, it's, not about, it's not about whether or not we lose productivity, we lose part of a sector and we gain another part. With Airbnb and the traditional accommodation, it's, it's changing. It's taking away from one and giving to another. But we don't know where it'll leave us. We, we, it's not happened before. It's a disruptive technology, and we have no idea where this is going to go. All we can do is trying to ride it out and control it as much as we can when we go. We are prohibited in local government from making rules and regulations that advantage one sector economically over another or one business over another. So we have the same argument with IGA and Coles and Kmart when they come in and they take over our small local shop shops. BP coming in with their big super, with their big giant big petrol stations, and the local petrol station going out of business. You know, well, or may go out of business. We're not allowed to make decisions on the basis that that business might go out. You know, that cease to exist and be replaced by another business. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. We are watching this happen, but we're actually quite powerless to intervene, and we, act, and we don't understand where this is going to end up. Uh, uh, this is just something, I, I think that's a really interesting question, and it's certainly something that I've turned my mind to through the course of the inquiry. For what purpose do you intervene with some form of policy? Because, um, you know, very often one of the things we saw was arguments about levelling the playing field was an argument about bringing um, certain forms of accommodation up or down to a particular standard. But the justifications for doing so need to be very clearly understood and articulated because erecting barriers or um, uh, in, enforcing certain forms of policies purely for the purposes of protecting one form of industry in transition in favour of another is, is, is perhaps not a, a, a legitimate public policy reason. Perhaps not. Perhaps it is. Um, but you, I think whenever you're considering industry intervention strategies and policies you need to be very clear in understanding why you're intervening and how you're intervening to what end. And and uh, and I think that that it's a local government has almost got it easy because sometimes it's state government you have to pick, and and that is the the art of I suppose government. And uh, as a backbencher, I'm glad I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Time for the one last. Ooh. Round two, yeah. two last <laughs> questions. Sure. Okay. 
Uh, my name's Kelly, I'm from the Duxton Hotel. My question is surrounded more about the recent changes I've noticed over the past year or two in regards to uh, these channels such as Airbnb, Stays, etc. and the transition onto the third party channels. And does that contribute towards, so when I say that, I mean onto your booking.coms, your Qantas Airlines are now working with Airbnb. Mm. And does that contribute to the increase in volume that we're seeing in these Airbnb bookings coming through? Short answer is I don't know. Um, uh, what I think is interesting is seeing how many of these traditional accommodation providers are now looking to utilise Airbnb-like platforms to now sell vacant hotel rooms. And, uh, and in fact, uh, there is a accommodation, a traditional hotelier now who has launched a short-term rental style platform now to sell its rooms. And obviously, booking.com, you can hire an apartment that is a Airbnb type apartment or a hotel room. So, so there, it's interesting to see how um, uh, companies respond. I'm seeing increasingly taxis driving around with an Uber sticker on their bumper bar or a chauffeur sticker. So there are some t guys with taxi plates who are operating on both platforms. So um, it, it, it's sort of, it's it's an interesting question. It's not being left behind, really. Yeah, well look, I mean, at the end of the day, and I think particularly for the large hotels, um, you, I, I do, there are definite differences between large hoteliers and small traditional accommodation providers. Definite differences. Large hoteliers are global, dynamic uh, companies, usually with access to quite considerable capital, and have large teams capable of innovating and developing and evolving their business models. And, and I think that there's a very different way that that sector can respond. I, it is a very different kettle of fish for small traditional uh, business operators. Thank you. So this is, I'm sorry, I apologize. It will be my, will be our last question for the event. So, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you um, for your presentations. Probably because it's government regulation. Could you, could you please state your name and organization? Uh, Justin Davies from Emerging Nation. I'm not involved in this, uh, this industry. Thank you. Um, probably more a question for, for Jessica, if you would. So the sharing economy is growing in every sector. In time, uh, cars will be shared and be more ways to leverage assets and communities. Uh, sharing facilities and means of stripping costs down. Um, and the control of quality has changed from moving from rating or having an organisation rate and inspect to every interaction being um, being rated so those interactions are much more visible to buyers and passing the, the control back to buyers. I think the discussion about the tax industry is an interesting one but that was a government control profitable market um, and the only constant is change. So when markets change, what's happened in newspapers for example, you know businesses get hurt and that never, that's always been the way. Um, and, but I think if you try to fight against con what the consumer wants and what they demand, uh, you'll, uh, you'll never win. To my question, part of the cost that affects various industries is government overhead. We look at Amazon's going to be coming into, um, yeah, into Australia or here, and that'll impact business. The, and the question around fair playing field, I think actually in part relates to things like company tax, where these offshore organisations effectively transfer price and don't make a profit. Very hard thing to influence at a state level. I'm wondering what we're trying to do in terms of influencing at a federal level, how these organisations uh, pay their fair share. Look, I think that's a really, really important uh, question. And certainly in my past life, working for energy companies that very often are multinational, own assets in Australia, they're headquartered overseas, they don't pay much tax necessarily in Australia, but what they do do is have massive intercompany loans where they're charging 13, 14, 15% to the Australian subsidiary so that its costs are huge, its deductions are massive because of this expensive finance that they can only secure from their parent. And all that money and wealth goes overseas. Huge question, huge question. And to his credit, Joe Hockey, you know, the, 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 the Liberal Treasurer, really tried to tackle this. Well, how do we ensure 
that all this value that we're generating here in this Australian economy is not going overseas. It comes back to that point I was making before, that we all pay our, road, our rates, we all pay our taxes, um, and we all stand, or we should, benefit from these disruptive industries as well. I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't reward risk-taking and innovation. We absolutely should. It's what keeps a vibrant, diverse, thriving economy ticking over. There should be reward for risk and reward for entrepreneurialism. But we should also make sure that those of us who are paying for those things, supporting the roads, the infrastructure, all the sorts of things that we were talking about, what makes a tourism destination worth visiting. We're all paying for it, we should all stand to gain from it, and uh, and it is a, a really significant public policy question how we get multinationals in particular to pay their fair share. There is a lot of smoke and mirrors around tax, and certainly it did come up in this, and it was funny how uh, some of the larger companies were at pains to tell us how much tax they pay and how they pay all their tax. And uh, having from a past life, you know, it's one of the good things about having people come into the parliament who have lived experience in the real world and aren't just career politicians. You know how to call book, you know how to identify um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when people are potentially not being uh, as uh, forthright as they could be in their presentation of facts. Um, <laughs> there you go, I'm learning this political language. Um, so, you know, you do need to be able sometimes to cut through and question these things. And, uh, and I do think it's a real challenge for us politically to, to manage. So thank you for the question.